Hi, John Hess here with another fascinating journey into the technological history of filmmaking. This time I'm turning my attention to sound. No doubt if you've messed around with a digital audio recorder or even the sound settings on your computer, you might have noticed that there are two common sampling frequencies used to record and play back digital sound that are really close to each other. There's the CD quality 44.1 kilohertz and the so-called DVD quality of 48 kilohertz. But why are there two settings that are so close together? Especially since no one could really actually tell those two sample rates apart. Is it just marketing nonsense that 48 is just supposed to be better? Nope. The surprising answer to this question has to do with color television standards. Now let's first refresh our basic understanding of digital audio. I do cover a lot of this in my video series on sound and filmmaking, card in the corner, but let's review. Sound is just compression energy flowing through the air. We can measure this and graph this wave energy as a waveform like this, which you've seen in any editing software. Now to convert this analog waveform into a digital signal, we have to sample and measure it over time. In other words, we slice it up into tiny discrete packets. The number of packets per second is the sample frequency and the range of values per packet is described by the bit depth. This is called pulse code modulation. Now these two numbers describe what is in essence the resolution of a recorded digital audio signal. The bit depth describes the dynamic range of the audio power from the smallest, quietest parts to the loudest and everything in between. And the sample frequency determines the range of frequencies that can be obtained from the lowest bass notes to the highest pitch sounds. So we should just figure out what the highest pitch that most people can hear, which is around 20 kilohertz, though in my tests I can barely hear up to 15 kilohertz, and just set the sampling rate to that number, right? Well, that wouldn't work because of something called the Nyquist-Shannon Sampling Theorem, which states that in order to recreate a frequency, you need to sample it at more than twice the frequency. In other words, if we want to recreate the highest pitch most humans can hear, which is 20 hertz, you would need to sample the audio at more than 40 hertz. A little headroom would be necessary for some low pass filters in order to avoid aliasing. And aliasing is when you have other wave patterns emerging as a result of the sampling. We see it in video with really tight patterns that create alternating patterns called moiré. Now let's talk about getting to 44.1 and 48 kilohertz. In the late 1970s, when digital audio was just getting started, we didn't have a standard yet in place. There were sample rates as low as 32 kilohertz being used by the BBC and the European Broadcasting Union, which obviously sacrificed some high-end audio quality for simplicity, all the way up to 50 kilohertz being used by recording equipment manufacturers like DECA. Now to set a standard, it was important to achieve the 20 kilohertz limitation of human hearing, and it was eventually agreed upon that 16 bits per sample were necessary as a bare minimum, though they made the option of increasing that available in the future. But here's the problem. It's the late 70s, and even though they had pulse code modulators that could convert analog to digital, hard drives at the time were simply not up to the task of storing all that data. To make digital recording widespread and affordable, they turned to a proven technology, videotape. So in order to record audio, the PCM adapter converted the audio into pseudo video and coded as a binary black and white video signal on the tape. You see, analog television is composed of lines, which are encoded one right after the other. So instead of recoding a portion of the image, the auto recorder is encoding a series of binary signals. But back to the sample rate. Now it was decided that the standard for recording audio on videotape should work on both NTSC machines using the old black and white standard of 60 hertz to match the power line frequency, and not the 59.94 color standard, we'll get to that in a second, and PAL machines which ran at 50 hertz. Now here's how the math works out. With NTSC, there are 525 lines, 
and with PAL, there are 625 lines. Now we can't use the blanking lines, which is how the video signal syncs itself up. So we really only have 490 lines to work with, with NTSC and 588 lines in PAL. Now that's each frame. Now since interlace breaks the frames into two separate fields, we have 245 lines per field in NTSC and 294 lines in PAL. Now with NTSC being 60 fields per second and PAL being 50 fields per second, that gives us exactly 14,700 lines per second to encode our audio into. Now, as I stated earlier, we want our sample rate to be higher than 40 kilohertz. So we have to encode not just one sample per line, but three 16-bit samples per line. And three times 14,700 equals 44,100 hertz. Now, why not four times? Well, that would give us 58,800 hertz, which engineers thought was a little bit wasteful. Also, why not decimal like 2.8? Well, that would mess up the video signal and make it really hard to work with. You want integers here in order to make everything nice and clean. Now, incidentally, 44,100 is also the product of the squares of the first four prime numbers. Two squared times three squared times five squared times seven squared. But you probably already knew that. You can see here in this promo video for early CD technology what that signal actually looked like. There are those three samples per line horizontally. The Sony PCM-1600 was released in 1978, and it became the first commercial video-based 16-bit recorder, recording digital audio onto umatic format tapes, also known as three-quarter inch tapes. From there, the digital genie was let out of the bottle, and the first commercial CD was produced on August 17, 1982, from a recording of Claudio Arau's performing Chopin waltzes and the first pop album on CD, Billy Joel's 52nd Street, which went on sale in Japan on October 1st, 1982. And for completeness, I will mention that there were a few other sampling rates in those first few years of digital recording, notably 44,056 hertz, which corresponds to the use of the non-integer field rate of 59.94, but ultimately 44.1 kilohertz became the standard for CD audio. Now, how did 48 kilohertz emerge? Remember how these original digital recorders recorded onto old black and white NTSC standard of 60 hertz. If you're making an audio CD, it doesn't matter if it doesn't match the futzy television frame rate, but if you're recording to match a picture, well, then it matters. Let's back up and walk through some of the math. If you wanted to be able to include an integer number of samples for 24, 25, and 30 frames per second, then your sample rate needs to be a multiple of the least common multiple, which is 600 hertz. But what if you needed to find a common multiple that included the color standard of 59.94 or 29.97 frames per second? Now to understand the math, let's use the more precise definition, 30 divided by 1.001. Now the least common multiple among all these frame rates is 30,000 hertz. So we need a multiple of 30,000 to get all these frame rates to have an integer number of samples per frame. So we'd have to bump up to a sample rate of 60 kilohertz to be able to recreate the frequencies of human hearing. Anything other than that would require either splitting the sample or doing leap frame, in which you skip over a sample on a line that way they will add up to the correct number. It's the same idea with leap year, adding an extra day every four years to make up for the slightly longer year, the longer orbit of the Earth around the sun. Now this would lead to some complications, requiring the use of some sort of digital flag to notify the stream reader of a skip in the sample. Not impossible, but it is a bit annoying. But going all the way to 60 kilohertz was a big ask in the early 80s and considered wasteful because it was 50% higher than the needed 40 kilohertz threshold set forth by Nyquist Shannon. So ultimately, leap frames were the preferred option. And when you introduce leap frames, you have now a choice between 45, 48, 50, 52.5, and 54 kilohertz. Now, since the Europeans were already broadcasting using 32 kilohertz, they went ahead and adopted 48 kilohertz as a standard as the simple 3 to 2 relationship between 32 and 48, making conversion really easy. 
And since the Europeans weren't broadcasting in NTSC, they didn't care about the leap frame issue at all. Ultimately, it boiled down to two sample rates, 48 kilohertz and 50 kilohertz. Now, 50 kilohertz required a leap frame every three frames of NTSC, whereas 48 kilohertz requires a leap frame every five frames. But the drawback to 50 kilohertz is it required leap frames for every three frames for black and white, 30 frames per second, and 24 frames per second. And since 48 kilohertz was already widely adopted and used in Europe in the recording industry, and since it was really easy to use with 24 FPS, 48 kilohertz became the standard audio sampling for all video acquisitions. The NTSC folks would just have to have a little bit more equipment to read and flag those leap frames, but in the decades since, it's never been an issue. And there you have it. Since it was established in the CD format in 1982, 44.1 kilohertz remains the default sample for anything that is audio only, whereas 48 kilohertz is used for anything that involves video. Now that we're no longer constrained by the physical capacity of compact discs or even hard drive memory, I imagine we might start to move toward the video standard of 48 kilohertz. But honestly, I'm not an audiophile, so I'll sit out that internet form flame more. Thanks for indulging me in exploring this little caveat of filmmaking technology. Please like, subscribe, and ring that bell, and do whatever the YouTube overlords wish for you to do. Thank you to my Patreon patrons for hanging in there. I know I've been out for a while dealing with my own personal issues, but I hope I can come back with a lot more interesting trips through the history and science and hopefully the fun of filmmaking. Well, if that's all for I have for you guys, until next time, go out there, make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at FilmmakersIQ.com.